Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're about to get started with our veg fest here in O'Callum. We're so happy to have you here with us for our first ever annual O'Callum veg fest. We wanted to make sure that this is the best of it possible, so we made sure that we invited not one, not two, but three vegan MCs for you today. So please give us a big round of applause for Mr. Vegan Evan, Amari Smigna, and Royce Ashcroft. Well, hello everybody. How are you all doing today? Great. Hello, Ocala Veg Fest. Yes, thank you, announcer, who that was. <laughs> Let us introduce ourselves a little bit more formally. So, I'm Vegan Evan, and I am the president of Animal Hero Kids, and Animal Hero Kids is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization that reaches millions each year, and their message is to spread the word of kindness to all. I am also a spokesperson for Solutionary Species, and I am a spokesperson for Waking Justice, and uh, so I'm a vegan rapper and speaker, and I just try to save the animals. Evan, tell them how old you are as well, too. So I'm eight years old, and I'm vegan. He's eight years old, and his resume is more impressive than half of us out here. Can everyone say, hey Amari? Hey Amari! Hello everyone, it is great to see you. I am a runway model, I'm also a vegan activist, and Royce and I, this is my handsome fiance. We run a vegan entertainment network called Nor 17. We do special events and mixers. We just did vegan skate night this Friday, so if you're interested, please come and talk to us. We have great information for you. Thank you all for being here today. Give it up for yourself. Yes! And my name is Royce Ashcroft. Can everybody say, Hello, Royce? Hello, Royce! Can you say it a little bit louder for me? Okay, I want a lot of energy. Can everybody say, Hello, Royce? Hello, Royce! I like it. Yes, I'm a game show host. I am about to get married to this beautiful woman right here. Yeah! And then, yeah, just an entrepreneur, MC, all that other good, fun stuff. But today, we get to be your MCs for this amazing Ocala Veg Fest. We do have to make a quick couple of announcements before we get started, just so everyone has the information. These four bins in front of me, they are for compost. We're going to be a Veg Fest that does compost so we don't waste this food. Please don't throw any trash. And Zero these waste. bins up here, there are trash cans around the fest for you to use. Just keep that in mind. Tell man. So how many of you are on that zero waste life? You're trying to get a little bit, uh, you know, less zero waste life. Have a little less trash. Well, yeah, we about it too. And also, uh, we got this nice little photo walk up here. Vegan Evan, you want to tell them about that? So uh, I think that everyone should uh, please check out the photo wall. As they said, the compost. They're having a raffle, and then there's uh, the water refilling station if you need some water. What's that hashtag you're gonna use? Hashtag Ocala Veg Fest. Make sure to take yeah. Yeah. Ocala We're doing a hashtag Ocala Veg Fest so that way Evan can find your post on social media. He's not old enough to be on Facebook, but he has one anyway, so you know, find him. His mom runs it for him. Mom, where are you at? Ray, raise your I hand. I saw her, she was here. Uh, she we was... saw her too. She's a little short, so there she is. Wait, where is she? She had to stand up so everybody can see you. She, she is standing. She, oh, 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 hey, Shannon, hey, hey. <laughs> well, I guess we should go ahead and get things rolling with this veg fest, right? Yeah. We have our first speaker. Yes, are you guys ready for our first speaker today? Coach. 
specializing in diabetes, autoimmune disease, and chronic kidney disease. She has a bachelor's degree in human physiology and a master's degree in cardiopulmonary physiology. She is certified in plant-based nutrition. Give it up for plant-based nutrition. By the prestigious E. Colonel and T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutritional Studies and is a certified health educator by the reputable Wellness Forum. Please, a big round of applause for Miss Vanessa Sardi. How's everybody doing? Yes. Hello, Ocala. Is anybody willing to volunteer why they are here today or what brought them here today? Me? <laughs> anybody else? Anybody trying vegan out for the first time? Anybody a vegan already? from the medical field and my journey has been interesting and I'm here to tell you a story about my journey through the pharmaceutical industry and how I came to find out why our best medicine is not in the form of a prescription it's in the form of a grocery list are you guys ready all right so let's start with Hippocrates. Let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. He said that in 450 BC. How did we miss the memo? Where did we go wrong? Uh, he who does not know food, how can he understand the disease of man? Does anybody know how much nutrition education a physician gets in medical school? Zero. I think they get one elective semester. What's the most important thing we do? Yes, what we nourish our bodies with, but they don't get any education. So we really can't blame them too much, right? They're trained to treat disease. Uh, so they talked a little bit about me, but I'm gonna tell you, I started my career out in pharmaceutical sales and I thought I was doing the right thing by people. I sold lifestyle medications. So let me, disclaimer, do not discontinue your medication or reduce the dose of your meds based on anything I say today without first consulting your physician. Say yes if you heard me. Yes. All right, very good, thank you. Um, so, Let's talk about the beginning of my journey where I kind of call the brainwashing, where the brainwashing began. Uh, I spent four weeks up at headquarters and we weren't allowed to leave the premises. And they just drilled the message home of what we're supposed to say about medication, how we're supposed to handle the doctor's objectives, how we're supposed to get physicians to prescribe more medication. So here's where it started. I got hired, and within two weeks' time, can everybody see the screen up here? Can you see that's a car? Brand new car. I didn't even have to go pick it up. They delivered it to my front door. Woo. Then I didn't have to pay for oil changes. I got a free gas card, so even if I drove to go on vacation, they paid for my gas. I got a free computer the next day. Of course, you gotta have a printer that comes with the computer. A free iPhone. I had a corporate American Express card. It was my first ever credit card. Didn't know what to do with that. Free health insurance, top of the line health insurance. If I took any medication, it was free. Free gym membership. If my tennis went bad, they paid for my tennis shoes. And of course, a computer bag. And the list goes on and on and on. Not to mention, we make pretty good money, don't we? Pharmaceutical reps. So, as a 20-something year old, 
that just had all of this merchandise delivered to my front door, imagine what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, I'm about to go out and do something pretty big. I'm about to go out and change the world. Because why else would this company be investing this much money and time and energy and effort to train me? By the time I finished training, they spent $300,000 on me. And there were about 300 people just in my class alone. So they invested heavily in us. They needed our loyalty. Because if we woke up to the reality of what was really going on, they'd lose us. So it was important. Our loyalty was important to them, and this was one of the ways that they gained our loyalty. So what is health? What is your definition of health? Anybody want to volunteer? Absence of disease. Anybody else? Definition of health? I think it's a personal thing, and I think whatever your definition of health is, is yours. Maybe it's the state of being free from illness. Uh, the World Health Organization says it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And not merely the absence of disease. But whatever your definition of health is, is accurate. But what I can tell you health is not. What health is not it's, oh, my blood sugar is controlled because I take diabetes medication. That's not health. It's not, my cholesterol numbers finally look good because I take a statin. That's not health. My blood pressure is finally down to an acceptable limit according to my physician because I take blood pressure medicine. That's not health. My symptoms of my autoimmune disease are better because I'm taking medication. That's not health. But if I said, I just went on a whole food plant-based lifestyle and my cholesterol is under control, would that be health? Yes. And you're gonna find later on in my presentation, which I might say, another disclaimer too, I might say some things that upset you or make you angry, but you deserve to know. You deserve to know the truth. And I wasn't allowed to say these things while I was working in the industry, but you know what, I can now, because I left. So I'm here to tell you the truth. I'm not here to bash the industry. I'm not here to bash anybody. I'm just simply here to tell you what I know to be true, so that you can make the best informed decision for your health. Agree? All right. So let's just go over a few statistics. In 2014, 3.2 billion drugs were ordered or provided in physician offices. 3.2 billion. That's me bringing samples to physicians, because that's how we would get in through the front door, is to our samples. How many people know at least one person taking a prescription medication? All right, keep your hand up. How many people know two, uh, somebody that's taking two prescription medications? Okay, keep your hands up. How many people know someone who's on five? Whoa. So according to statistics, about 20% of Americans are on five or more prescription medications. That's a lot of drugs. U.S. spending on prescription medications jumped 13% to $374 billion. So let's, let me pause here for a second because are medications important? Do they have their place? Absolutely. If you have a massive car accident, God forbid, and you have to go to the hospital, there are medications that will keep you alive while the surgeons work to save your life. If you're in the midst of a heart attack and you have to be rushed to the hospital, there are procedures and medications that are gonna keep you alive until you get stabilized. This is where medicine is wonderful, a miracle, 
But where medication is failing the public miserably is in chronic lifestyle diseases. What's a lifestyle disease? Diabetes, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease. A lifestyle disease is a disease that got you, that lifestyle got you into, right? So what's going to get you out of that mess? Changing your lifestyle, absolutely. So not a prescription. If lifestyle led to your diabetes, it's only by changing your lifestyle that you can reverse your diabetes. Has anybody ever known someone who has taken a diabetic medication and reversed their disease? They don't reverse the disease. They may get your, your blood sugar under control, but they don't reverse the disease. You still have diabetes. Would it, as a, think of, uh, as a business person, would it be profitable for pharmaceutical companies to manufacture a drug that reversed a chronic condition? That'd be really bad for business, right? We don't want to kill you because we can't make money if you're not alive. But we don't want to cure you because we can't make money if you're not sick. So we're just going to keep you somewhere in the middle and stabilized, right? Because 86% of what we make comes from lifestyle diseases. Lifestyle diseases. Global revenue for pharmaceuticals was over $1 trillion in the year 2014. So, why did I leave? You saw all my perks, right? And I, I think the only thing I do miss are my bonus checks. But I woke up one day and realized that my bonus checks every quarter were based on patients refilling their prescription. So as long as you and you and you were going to the pharmacy and refilling your prescription regularly, I was going to get paid. And so I woke up one day and realized, whoa, these people are never meant to get off this medication, ever. And then I started looking at people in the waiting rooms, at doctor's offices, and the ones that had the biggest shoe boxes full of meds or the biggest bags right, with all their prescription bottles in it, they looked the most unhealthy. They didn't have color in their face. They were tired. Their quality of life was going down the drain. And I said, what's going on? This is supposed to be helping people. And people are getting worse. Something's not right here. I thought I was part of the solution. And I was quickly realizing I was part of the problem. So I'm going to speed through this because this just talks about spending. So let me tell you the straw that broke the camel's back and why I left. Who's seen forks over knives? Yes. Yay for us, Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Campbell who kind of led this movement. I was eating a chicken sandwich as I was watching forks over knives. I got halfway through it and then I put it down. And I've never touched an animal product ever since then. But that documentary sent me on a mission and, and it cleared the smoke from my head and made me realize the level of collusion that goes on between the government, the food industry, the meat industry, and the dairy industry. They're all in cahoots together. And you probably already had an idea about this, but I'm going to take you a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole today and tell you some things you probably didn't know that is crucial for you to know to be your own best health advocate. <clears throat> so the straw that broke the camel's back. First it was the documentary. And then I was in a cardiology office and he had a, a patient, a 65-year-old woman, and we were trying to decide whether she needed to have an angiogram. Does everybody know what an angiogram is? Pretty invasive procedure, right? Where they, they wire up, inject dye into your coronary arteries to see if you have a blockage. 
This woman was terrified, rightfully so. Well, I had met her, I had seen her, I had talked to her. I said, look, we're gonna do this blood test and this blood test will determine whether or not you need an angiogram. And so that night I went home and I prayed and I, and I thought about her all night long and I said, please, please let this blood test determine that this woman does not need to have an angiogram because she is absolutely terrified. Her fear was tangible. The blood test comes back and it's great. It, beyond any shadow of a doubt, this woman does not need to have an angiogram. So I rush back to the cardiologist's office and I can't wait to see her face after he tells her the good news. And I'm waiting for her to come out of the room and she didn't come out. The cardiologist came out. And I said, well, how did it go? He said, well, you know what, Vanessa? I think I'm gonna do the angiogram anyway. I said, you're gonna do what? He said, you don't understand. Seeing patients in clinic, to me, is boring. I'd much rather be in procedures, because they have minors in surgery. I said, so, time out. Let me make sure I understand what you're saying to me right now. You're telling me that you're gonna take the 65-year-old woman to have an invasive procedure that comes with a 1% mortality rate, side effects, not to mention she's terrified because you're bored? He said, yeah, why not? And it was at that point I realized he had forgotten this was a human being sitting in front of him. He had got caught up in the system. Is he a bad person? No. But he got caught up in the system. Now, I've called on a ton of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of physicians, and they're good people. And most of them, most of them, want to do the right thing by you and they want to help you and this is why they went into this profession but there are bad seeds in every occupation right and I just happened to cross one but that was unacceptable to me I'm like we don't do this to people so I walked away from the industry at that point in time and I never went back because I said you know what I need to figure out how to get in front of that woman before she even ends up having chest pain and ends up even needing to go to the cardiologist. And when I realized that a plant-based lifestyle could actually reverse coronary artery disease, which cardiologists will still to this day say that you can't reverse that disease, or diabetes, or most of the diseases uh, with nutrition, which you absolutely can. When I realized that, I said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done being part of the problem. I wanted to be part of the solution. So, what's the number one killer in America? Or worldwide, really? Number one killer. Heart disease. Number two. Cancer. Number three. Medical error. Gold star to grow to my, my best friend. <laughs> my best friend. Medical error is the number three killer. Medical error. Heart disease, cancer, medical error. So what is that comprised? 225,000 Americans die each year as a result of their medical care. We're going wrong somewhere. Something's going terribly wrong, right? Medication errors, 7,400. Unnecessary surgery, kind of like the one I just told you about before with the cardiologist, 12,000 unnecessary surgeries. Hospital errors, 20,000. Hospital-borne infections, 80,000. Stay out of the hospital if you can at all costs. Look at the drug adverse effects, 106. That is unbelievable. So I want to, in the help of time, I want to just touch on reference ranges, right? Because we hear you want to be between this number and this number, or this number. If you're here, you're good. But if you're in this range, you're not good. 
Just know that they're healthy people living outside of the range, and they're very unhealthy people living inside of ranges. So you really need to take the whole individual into consideration. And the problem with drugs is that when we start treating people who have pre-hypertension or pre-diabetes, these drugs don't do any good. Their efficacy is almost nil. So be very careful about getting caught up in the disease mongering system. This is where you go to the doctor and he gives you one medication and then you have a side effect and then he gives you another medication and then you have a side effect from that. Now you're on another medication and now you're caught up in the system. And it's really hard to get out. It's really, really hard to get out of the system. But let's look at who's running the show. So, redefining criteria. This is one of the take home messages that I want you to go home with today. Expert panels are convened to redefine the criteria. Because in, in think, about, uh, think about any industry and business. What do shareholders want to see? Growth curves, right? Stakeholders, they've got to see a growth curve. Well, how do we increase market share in pharmaceuticals? What do we do? We medicate more people, right? We sell more drugs. How do we do that? One way is to lower the threshold for which you can be diagnosed. So who do you think came up with pre-diabetes and pre-hypertension? And who's ever heard of osteopenia? Aha! Uh -huh. These are entirely pharmaceutical driven so that we can medicate more people. And that's how we make our growth curve go up. So the head of the panel that redefined diabetes was a paid consultant to seven companies that manufactured diabetes medication. Nine of the 11 people who redefined criteria for hypertension had ties to drug companies that make drugs to treat it. Eight of the nine panel members who changed the criteria for cholesterol worked for companies that manufactured cholesterol medication. The criteria for diagnosis, here's osteoporosis, right? Look at this. It was developed in partnership with the Osteoporosis Foundation. The advisory board for this group includes 31 drug companies and device manufacturers. These conditions are so that we can medicate more people. When they changed the criteria for type 2 diabetes in 1995, the blood sugar used to be 140, fasting. Now it's 126. If you're 126, then you are now a diabetic. So overnight, a 14 point decrease in the threshold, guess what that resulted in? Yeah, 1.9 million new customers, lifelong customers, just by dropping the 14 points. Just by dropping in 14 points. So changing criteria, this is, this is very profitable for, for pharmaceutical companies. We saw a 14% increase in diabetes, 35% increase in hypertension, 86% increase in hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, and an 85% increase in the diagnosis of osteoporosis. We're selling some drugs now. So here's this other take home message that I want you to have. If getting on medication led to better health outcomes, right? If taking a statin, does everybody know what a statin is? They practically give it to everybody, Lipitor, Crestor, Zocor, Simvastatin. If taking a statin meant that your risk of dying from a heart attack or a stroke decreased drastically, then that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? But does it actually do that? 
It does not. Can anybody guess what the best data on a statin is? The best percent decrease in your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. What percentage do you think the best statin has performed? Any guesses? How many? Okay, not bad. Close, lower. 1.6%. 1.6%, which is nothing, right? We're taking a medication that's toxic to the liver, causes muscle pain, makes your lab work look pretty, but it's not doing anything to reduce your risk of dying from a heart attack or stroke. That's why we take the medicine to begin with, right? That's the whole point of taking the medicine. We find this with diabetes meds. It doesn't reduce your risk of going blind, kidney failure, losing a limb. It just simply makes your blood work look, your blood sugar look better on your lab work. That's it. So how did this happen? Remember when the AIDS epidemic broke out in the 1980s? These guys pushed for a bill in Congress to get drugs to market faster. Because for that population, it made sense to do so, right? They were dying, and they were going to die regardless. So they didn't care about the safety of the drug. They didn't care whether it proved that it really worked well, because it was the only thing they had. It was the only hope. So it made sense to get those drugs to market in a hurry, right? The problem is that every other company piggybacked on that, and the only thing drugs had to do was show that they lowered your blood pressure. You get to go to market or that they lowered your sugar. You get to go to the market. But that's not how we should approve drugs. We should approve drugs based on the premises that they actually improve your health outcomes, right? We know a plant-based lifestyle improves health outcomes. We know this beyond any shadow of a doubt. And we know beyond any shadow of a doubt, prescription medications do not. They do not. So last message here, I'm going to show you a little trick about how we manipulate data. Because you're probably thinking, well, but Vanessa, on the news, on the commercials, I hear these statins reduce your risk of a heart attack by 50% or 35% or 44%, right? Those numbers have been manipulated. Here's how we do it. You ready for this? All right, this is an important one. Oh, by the way, these studies actually looked at um, diabetes. They put two groups of diabetes, and this group they, they aggressively managed with multiple medications and drove their sugar down. And in this group over here, they just got one medication and just brought it down moderately. They had to stop several trials with thousands of people because the people that were in the group getting the most medication were 25% more likely to die. So for them to stop a study of that magnitude, it doesn't happen often because they cost millions of dollars. We'll do anything to prevent a study from stopping. But that was eye-opening because here I am out there selling a combination therapy. I'm selling a, two drugs in one pill and pushing that as first-line therapy. Meanwhile, I had no idea these studies existed. So, how do we manipulate data? Why are you hearing on the news that statins reduce your risk of dying way more than they actually do? So, let's pretend like you have invented a drug, a statin, a cholesterol drug. Here we go. So here we're going to talk about the statistics. Here we go. You've invented a statin drug. And you want to see how well it performs. So you take 200 people. And 100 people get a sugar pill, a placebo, that doesn't have any active ingredient. And the other 100 get the actual medication. And we look over a five-year period of time to see how many people had events. How many, people, how many people had events in the group that was taking the active drug? 
Two people. How many people that were on the sugar pill? Four people. What is the absolute risk reduction? Four minus two, two percent. Two percent. Now, if I tried to go into a doctor's office and sell that medication on the premises that, hey, doc, we're going to lower your patient's cholesterol, may cause some side effects, they may get some muscle pain, you're going to have to check their uh, blood because it's pretty toxic to the liver, but we're going to reduce their chance of having a heart attack by 2%. Do you think I'm going to sell anything? No! But what if I said, doc, 50% reduction in their patient's risk of having a heart attack or stroke. How's that sound? That sounds way better, right? So where did I get 50% from? Does anybody know? Well, two is half of four. So that's a 50% reduction. That's your relative risk reduction. Those are the numbers that we report to the public. What do you think we report adverse event events in? The absolutes, right? Exactly. We report, the, because that number's a lot lower. You want to know what the absolute risk reduction is. That's what you want to know. That's the number that's important to you. So, 50% versus 2%. So the take home message here because I'm pushing my envelope one time. The take home message, the reason why I told you that story about the cardiologist, right, is that you have to be your own best health advocate. Ask questions, ask your doctor questions. I don't care how full his waiting room is or how full the rooms are, you have every right to keep that physician in there and ask questions. What are my alternatives? What is the risk of doing this versus the benefit of doing this procedure? Is there an alternative? Let me go home and think about it. Nothing is as urgent as they make it seem. Go home, do your homework, do your research, talk to people, don't make the decision. Be an informed patient, right? Or you can switch to a plant-based lifestyle and just probably avoid the doctor altogether. That would be the best choice right there, right? Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes. How do you talk to a physician in a medical setting to promote Great question. So, did everybody hear his question? How do you talk to physicians and promote a plant based lifestyle when they're being heavily funded by the pharmaceutical industry? And that's a great question um, because a lot of them aren't bought in yet to this idea that nutrition is the way to go because it's been drilled in their brain in medical school, you treat disease. You treat symptoms of disease, not the underlying cause. So it's gonna take a forward-thinking physician, uh, unfortunately, it's very, very difficult. The other thing is, is there's this thing called the standard of care. Has anybody heard of that? Standard of care. So what that means is if you go to the doctor and your cholesterol is a certain number, then that doctor is mandated by insurance companies to prescribe this, then this, then this, in that order. I've had doctors tell me, Vanessa, I can't stand statins. I don't want to prescribe them. But if I don't, and that patient leaves my office and ends up having a heart attack, I get sued because I wasn't practicing the standard of care. Who do you think dictates the standard of care? The pharmaceutical industry. So physicians are kind of have their hands tied because if they don't practice the standard of care, they're gonna get sued. So I hope that addresses your question. Yeah, anybody have any other questions before I hand the mic over? Was this informative? Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and attention and questions. Be well.